Today, we're going to be talking about a company that arguably has the most storied history of all. And for all of their innovation, they have just as many mistakes and missed opportunities. We're talking, of course, about IBM. In 1984, IBM had become the most valuable company in the world, in part due to their success with the first IBM PCs. They did not foresee, however, how rapidly the PC market would grow and change. Their grip had already started to wane in the early days of the PC Clone Wars, with their worldwide market share slipping from an impressive 42% in the early 80s to around a paltry 9% in September of 1992. One of their answers to this fall from grace is an oft-forgotten part of early 90s PC history. Welcome back to the Serial Port. We're going to look at a small offshoot of IBM known as Ambra, and in this series, we'll take a look at a rare example of one of their systems and restore it for introduction to the museum. Ambra is hardly a blip on the huge list of winners and losers during the 90s, but we think their story illustrates what one insider from Ambra has called the most important period of personal computing. After the release of the IBM PC AT in 1984, the market featured an incredible array of IBM PC clone manufacturers, there were already over 200 of them in 1986. The companies we all know and love, like Compaq, Dell, and Gateway, all had their start in the 80s by making clones. And by 1990, the combination of Microsoft software and Intel processors started to become an entrenched standard for personal computers. Through the early 90s, the term IBM PC compatible began to lose significance. And by 95, the IBM reference had been mostly thrown out. We now just had PCs and the new dominant alliance in the market was Wintel, a portmanteau of Windows and Intel. The presence of these competitors, and more importantly, their innovation, quickly changed the name of the game for IBM. While IBM's status quo was to sell complex, expensive solutions to businesses and large organizations, they struggled to compete in the consumer computer market against commoditized hardware, retail sales distribution, as well as fierce price competition due to outsourcing and small overheads. With a rapidly declining market share, the fact was that PC hardware domination was over for IBM, and there was no going back. One of IBM's answers to this new world order was formally introduced in 1992. They unveiled ICPI, a subsidiary that stood for Individual Computer Products International. This unit was formed in the UK to try to compete in the lower-end PC market in Europe with a direct sales model that was becoming popular with some customers. These PCs and laptops would not carry the IBM name, but instead would be called AMBRA. It seems a little strange even today, but IBM created Ambra to clone their own product. The idea was relatively simple though. They wanted to see if they could succeed in the consumer PC market by emulating their competitors through outsourcing and direct sales, all without what they had called, quote, diluting the IBM name. The timing was a bit late though. Prices for home computers were already rapidly falling in the early 90s amid a recession and profit margins were shrinking. IBM had already launched the PS1 and value point line of PCs around this time as well, and they were furiously slashing prices in an attempt to win back their once impressive market share. It remained to be seen though whether customers would be swayed back to the IBM name, or if the newcomer Ambra could succeed where they hadn't. With the Ambra subsidiary launched in Europe and Canada, IBM launched the Ambra name in the US in August of 1993. Their models ranged anywhere from $1,200 to nearly $4,300. During their short time, they had a number of interesting products. At launch, they announced what they claimed was the world's first dual Pentium machine. The model was the TP60 and featured a single Pentium 60 MHz CPU, but with an empty socket that could support another. The CPUs were installed on a daughter board, which allowed manufacturers to use the same motherboard for different processor configurations. Time for a fat 90s fact. Did you know that the first Pentium CPUs were recalled by Intel? A floating point division bug was discovered by mathematics professor Thomas Nicely in 1994, and despite not having a large impact on users, it cost Intel $475 million to issue the recall, as well as a hit in the confidence of their products. Some of the 60 and 66 MHz Pentium CPUs, as well as a handful of the later 75 through 100 MHz CPUs were affected. The recall did lead to more stringent verification of processor operations, however, which later led to discovery of bugs in the Pentium 4 before they went to production, so this earlier misstep may have actually been a blessing in disguise. 
Now, let's get back to our story. Ambra also experimented with peripheral design, and one of the more interesting ones was an odd mouse design that had been called a, quote, torture device due to its bizarre, unergonomic shape. And then there was the IBM CPU line coined Blue Lightning. These had been introduced earlier by IBM as modified Intel 386s upgraded with a 486 instruction set. For the Amber line in the US, they offered a 66 MHz Blue Lightning model, but also offered standard DX2 models clocked at the same frequency. IBM didn't release much information about the Blue Lightning CPUs, so leave us a comment if you know anything interesting about them. And the last notable part of their history that we'll touch on was that Linus Torvalds used an Amber PC while at the Helsinki University in Finland. The early versions of the Linux kernel were developed on this PC, and amazingly, this piece of history survived long enough to be preserved in the university's museum. By the time AMRA debuted in the US, they commanded a forgettable 1% market share in Europe, far short of the 10% that CEO David Middleton wanted to capture. And so in March of 1994, AMRA closed its doors in Europe as the IBM branded models like the Value Point began to outsell them. A few months later, it was announced Amber would leave the U.S. market as well, ending the Amber experiment for good. The failure of Amber was the final demonstration to IBM that their hopes of conquering the PC market again were dead in the water. Their competitors were here to stay, and IBM had to find their place in this new mix. Shortly after the closure of Amber, IBM debuted the Aptiva, replete with multimedia features and meant to target a higher-end segment as they abandoned the bargain basement price point. Even though Ambra was only around for less than two years, it could be argued that they somewhat succeeded in their mission. They brought new, low-cost PCs to the market in a very short period of time and showed IBM that their massive overhead and bureaucracy was a hindrance that couldn't be ignored going forward. Ambra was one of the earlier death knells for IBM's PC business, and they exited the market entirely after selling the PC division to Lenovo in 2005. Despite their short existence, we think the Ambra story is significant and that it illustrates the cutthroat nature of the PC industry in the 90s. It was a time when PCs were entering households at a remarkable pace, and manufacturers were scrambling to find ways to differentiate their brands. While they may not have survived, Ambra's legacy gives us a glimpse into part of the exciting revolution that took place in the early 90s, and how success during this time was never guaranteed. Now that we can appreciate the history of this system, let's take a look at the example we have here in detail. All we know about it is that it has no hard drive, as we were told it was removed by the previous owner. We picked this up for sale locally. It had been languishing in a basement for who knows how long. It was surrounded by other IBM PCs, so we think the previous owner must have been a fan, and who knows, maybe this is the system that started it all for them. There is no indication of a model name on the PC except for this code here, BMT0033. It's on a removable, lockable cover for a three and a half inch drive. We're not quite sure what the purpose of this cover is, as the hard drive could be easily removed by just removing the entire chassis cover. Let us know in the comments though if you have any ideas. Searching for this code, we did find this webpage here that shows BMT0033 corresponds to the T466IVL. This indicates a mini tower, which is obviously what we have here, and a standard 46DX266 MHz system, but sadly this isn't a Blue Lightning model. The earliest mention we could find of this model was here in an issue of PC Computing from March of 1994. The T466 starts off with the D466 features, but adds more memory and expansion capability. This is important for us to know, as we want to know the original configuration of the system so that we can accurately restore it. And note no mention of a tape drive, so this Colorado drive was most likely an addition the previous owner made at some point in the past. Anyway, enough talking, let's head over to the serial port workshop so we can turn this system on and see what we get. Okay, so there's one problem. Let's take the cover off and disconnect the CD-ROM power really quick so that we can keep going.
Well, that's a good sign. So let's hook up a keyboard and get some video output so that we can see what's going on during the startup. We've got a nice system summary here, and we can see that we indeed have a 486DX2 66 MHz CPU, 16 MB of memory, and a BIOS date of February 1994. All of this matches up with a magazine ad that we saw earlier, so we're confident that this is indeed the T466 IVL model. So on this boot up, let's check out the BIOS setup. Amazingly, the system date is correct, so maybe that means the previous owner had actually used the system relatively recently. Note here that the disk is user-defined with the cylinders, heads, and sectors specified, which calculates out to a 452 megabyte hard drive. The magazine ad we saw earlier indicated these systems were supplied with a 440 megabyte hard drive, so this system probably had the original drive installed before it was removed. And because this is defined in the BIOS this way, we get a failure during the post sequence when it cannot access the drive. Let us know if you've seen these reminder options before. We definitely wanted to try these out to see what they do, so we'll set both of these options to daily. That was stressful, but without a hard drive, this is about as far as we can go. But now that we know that the system seems to be working, well, aside from the CD-ROM, we can go ahead and take a look at all of the components. So it looks like all of the expansion cards plug into a daughter board that then plugs into a slot connector on the motherboard itself. Our first card here is the sound card, and it has a couple of bad capacitors. Below that, we have our Diamond Viper VESA video card. And lastly, we have the dial-up modem. Ambra advertised many of their systems, including this one, as Pentium ready, so a Pentium overdrive CPU could theoretically work here. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, though, I think we're at a good stopping point. We now know that the core components of our system are working. In our next installment, we'll do a teardown of the Ambra and get started on the restoration. We'll have it back in action soon, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to keep up with our progress. Ambra is only but a small piece of IBM's history, but their story was one that was all too common during the early 90s, as companies tried and failed to claim a stake in one of the most exciting times for the PC industry. Our aim is to preserve these pieces of history and share them with the world so that they are not forgotten. Thank you for coming along with us on that journey, and we hope to see you next time on The Serial Port.